more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine, quality, integrated education a reality. And so today, we are struggling for something which says we demand genuine equality. Greetings, family, and thank you for joining us for this very special virtual presentation of Ashe Cultural Law Center's 2022 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Say the Chavez Call to Action. My name is Frederick Delahousse. I am affectionately known as Wood, and it is my immense pleasure to serve as the Chief Creative Officer of Ashe. I can be referred to in conversation by Wood or by pronouns he or him. I am a light-skinned, honey-butter-brown black brother from New Orleans, Louisiana, with brown eyes and thick eyebrows, and what some folks might call a goatee, I refer to as a pharaoh's mane. We come to you today from the extraordinary city of New Orleans. Um, the land we are in and around New Orleans is known as Bobancha. Bobancha is a Choctaw term that means place of many tongues, originally inhabited by the Chitty Macha Nation and prior to 1718 served as an important port and trading hub for more than 40 diverse indigenous peoples. So as we gather together on the attack of Ishak, Caddo, the Chitty Macha, the Choctaw, the Homa, the Natchez and Tunica people, as well as the Petite Nations, we also give thanks and recognize the Alabama, the Biloxi, the Kosai, the Ofo peoples, that's my dog, and all those who were forced into Louisiana from their ancestral lands. We deliver a land acknowledgement to affirm the historical legacy of colonialism by honoring and paying respect to the land which was taken by conquest and the domination of the people who inhabited the land. It also critically acclaims, affirms the imposition of white supremacy. It also allows us to acknowledge non-Western and, and knowing of holistically linking mind, body, and spirit. We are acknowledging that the space we are in, the land we are on, are all a part of who we are and how we know the world. We invite all in attendance to learn with us about the native and indigenous peoples, histories, and present day communities in Louisiana. So I wanna talk a little bit today about Ashe's 2022 mission. It is an open reckoning of our past and a focus release of that which never served us. It is a call to action to manifest a new way of collective being because normal was never good enough. So over the past two years, while struggling to meet the ever-changing, ever-shifting demands of a global pandemic, we have often found ourselves aching for things to go back to normal. As we watch the world erupt in righteous resistance against police brutality, and we never were able to engage, right, in the usual methods of how we care for ourselves as a community, especially unique to New Orleans and our second line culture we begin to more deeply examine what going back to normal really means. And what we thought about was going back to normal means a continued widespread injustice against black, brown, and indigenous bodies. Going back to normal means the destruction of the natural environment in service of corporate and industrial greed. Going back to normal means unnecessary poverty, poor health care, hunger, and oppression. So we release our minds from the grips of the status quo. And instead, we manifest a new way with these five affirmations that we are calling pillars for change. Number one, we are healthy. We live long and well. Health disparities along racial lines do not exist. Our pain is believed. Our health care is thorough and exemplary. Two, we are prosperous. Our worth is defined by us, not by the racist systems that are designed to oppress us, we earn what we are worth. We have equitable access to education, jobs, housing, and leisure. Number three, we are safe. We walk without fear in our neighborhoods and everywhere else. We are not victims of state sanctioned violence. We are not in jail. We are liberated. Number four, we are connected. We celebrate our expansive identities and experiences. We are pro-black and we are not divided nor diminished by labels that are designed to marginalize us, we lead, we lead with love. And number five, we are valued. 
we are seen, we are heard, we exist and create without fear of exploitation or erasure, for we are enough. So we invite you um, to gather with us this year, whether it be in the virtual space or in person to urgently reimagine what it is to manifest a new collective future together. Now, let me add a little land yet, right? Throughout today's program, you know, we would normally be together, right? This would be a luncheon. Everybody would be eating upon suckling crab cakes or, or, uh, or you know, if, you, if you're a meat person, we probably have some sort of stuffed chicken or something that you would be enjoying. But of course, because of the, the pandemic, we are in this virtual space. So with that being said, the way we connect now is throughout today's program, you'll see uh, some trivia questions that will pop up. For those who answer the questions correctly, you'll be immediately entered into a drawing for a little Ashe prize or two, and we'll announce the winner at the end of our program. So here's our first question. What organization was co-founded by Dr. King at New Zion Baptist Church right here in the city of New Orleans, Louisiana? Right here, actually in Central City. What organization was co-founded by Dr. King at New Zion Baptist Church right here in Central City, New Orleans? So throw your comments in, uh, throw your answers rather in the comments section. And uh, again, those who answer the questions correctly, you'll be, you might leave you here with a little something, something, right? Now, as many as you know, uh, ashe uh, is, a, is, a, is a Yoruba word that means let it be done. And we believe in art and culture as uh, the foundation of human development, which makes it imperative that we begin our time together today with the gifts, energy, and words of a, uh, what are we gonna call it? A healer, a singer, a songwriter, a, um, a cultural woman, warrior, wordsmith, goddess. I'm gonna say all in words because she embodies all those things. So family, please give your attention to my dear sister, Sunny Pass. Good morning or afternoon. I don't know what time it is, but either way, it's just a, a, a joy and true honor to be here, especially during this time in these reckoning kind of times it's, it's important for us to gather in this way i want to start with something um just a bit about us and who we are at um i share first we all have it all called and created from an intergalactic blueprint a supernatural source sweeping the atmosphere gathering stardust just to leave at the threshold of the door reminding you that when you enter you have been transported to a place where not only culture is created but also heaven. Here is a reminder that heaven is not only in the up above, but in the down below, where angels can serve you a hot plate and a cold drink, where a smile and a hug is the language of choice, where your divine spark is seen, felt, and acknowledged, where you can see your divinity in everything from the art on the walls to the visitors entering the doors for the first time. This is our shape. Beyond brick and mortar, beyond hammer and nail, this is a place that permeates the deepest parts of ourselves, a reflection of the eternal essence, a symbol of grace and gratitude here, where the power of the people is in the power of the name, Ashe, where the power of the name is the power of the people, where our history is made, where our children grow, where our elders live, where we celebrate our same and honor our different. This is Ashe, the place of expansion, where hearts and minds come to enlarge their territory, the place where we are all connected one to another, each enriched by the experiences of coming together. And isn't that what community is all about? So that's something a little bit about um, who we are and you'll see more, more of and hear more of rather um, who and, and what it is that we do. So the fact that we've come together again just during this, this time uh, to honor uh, a force that um, King is, I'm, I'm here to, to say as well. He said, we face, something that we face is a challenge. This challenge is to unite around powerful action programs to eradicate the last vestiges of racial injustice. We will be greatly misled if we feel that the problem will work itself out. Structures of evil do not crumble by passive waiting. If history teaches us anything, it is that evil is a recalcitrant and determined thing and never voluntarily relinquishes its hold short of an almost fanatical resistance. Evil must be attacked by counteracting persistence by the day-to-day -day assault of the battering rams of justice. He says, 
there's only one thing certain about time, and that is it waits for no one. And if it is not used constructively, certainly it will pass you by. So I, I, I can't say enough about the fact that just to give thanks about how we are using and utilizing this time right now to fortify and build these pillars that uh, Wood so eloquently mentioned. Here's about normal. They longed for their former state. They begged to go back to the normal way. They wanted an old thing while in the midst of a new time. And I'm reminded of all the things that have become normal in a society where abnormality is king and black folk are pawns. Strategic pieces strategically positioned in places of harm. Normal is black schools receiving $23 billion less than white ones. Normal is extracted community wealth and disparaging health outcomes. Normal is the problem of flaming bla framing black folk as the problem. Normal is white savior in chariots swinging low to fix black folk who are seen as the problem when the real problem is who and what has defined what normal is. So no. We will not go with the normal. The usual does not suit us. This is beyond reform. This is dismantling from the root up, up, up. Our eyes have always been on high, even when the system has continuously tried to keep us low from slavery to Jim Crow. Now is still filled with plantation politics, eager to keep old ways alive. Just keep the chattel in line. Oh, they're an unruly bunch. Their lives, they equal to nothing too much. But now how much is too much? especially when the not enough is all so familiar, when the devaluing of black life is a regular occurrence, when the hearts have disappeared and we only see hands holding institutions destined to fall on our heads, we are running for cover, stumbling through the rubble of racist policy and practice. So please, we rebuke the normal scene. We are beings worthy of every good thing, knowing, in the words of Andre Perry, there's nothing wrong with black folk that ending racism cannot solve. Now I tried to go fast because we only had a few minutes. You saw how I moved that in? <laughs> You're muted, Wood. Look, I'm just smiling and laughing at you. That's all. I wasn't even saying nothing. You see how we, we moved that in? I saw how you did that. You, I see, you, listen, you, you told me I had a certain amount of time, and people that know me know I can talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I do know you. Thank you, sister. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, family, um, now we ought to offer some words for grounding for my dear brother, Chavez. Thank you, Constance, with a question, real quick. Which two organizations merged to form the United Farm Workers Labor Union? Oh, another trivia question. I hope y'all getting these answers in. Check it out. Mr. Chavez, what do you see the immediate shape of your struggle in the future? I, what I want uh, more anything else, I'd like to see the poor take a, a, uh, uh, a very direct party shaping society and uh, let them make the decisions. And, uh, and whatever we say, whatever anybody says has really little consequence. If the people aren't involved, and in our case, if the poor aren't involved, change will never come. Ooh, yes, indeed. And in the spirit of uh, that dear brother's words, I'd like to introduce another cultural phenomenon. Uh, my dear sister, Sally Divine Ecclesiastes, is a mother, a daughter, an artist, a strategist, an educator, organizer, author. You got to take the scroll and just let it roll down the street with all her titles and everything. She's an author, event producer, of course. Um, community servant, I think, is the one that it always speaks to me uh, whenever I introduce her. But her pursuits, whether they conquered or unconquered, they span the realm of our existence. And her tenacious grace, indomitable spirit is an inspiration to artists and activists all over this entire globe. She serves as the chief equity officer of the Ashe Cultural Law Center, which means she my boss. So y'all, please welcome my dear sister, Asada Divine Ecclesiastes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Wood. Let me just say, um, I just I wish everybody the opportunity to be introduced by Wood, right? Like um, to see yourself through his eyes and his words, at least for me, is so uh, incredibly humbling and encouraging. 
So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again um, for attending our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Cesar Chavez call to action. We're especially appreciative because you know we wanted to be with you in your face, fist bumping, you know, Wakanda forever in, um, you know, but we are committed to being responsible in this time and are glad that you are too. Um, in 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. asked, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? But we've chosen community. Ashe's 2022 vision is an open reckoning of our past and a focused release on that which has never served us. So we release our minds from the grips of the status quo and instead manifest a new way. For we are the ones we have been waiting for. So I ask you, in 2022, what new intention will you set this year in the spirit of liberation? Please take a moment, follow the prompts on the screen and the chat to record your answers. We'll share them later in the program. Also, we have a question and answer session, and it's really important to us to capture your energy in this space because we're virtual. So please, at any point during the program, go ahead and type your questions in the chat. We really can't wait to get to them. So now I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing the first of our two keynote speakers. Um, when I learned about Jasmine Araujo, Jasmine Araujo, I'm committed to saying it correctly. And if I didn't, Jasmine, when you get on, please um, correct me. But I'm just so appreciative um, of the work and inspired um, by your founding of Southern Solidarity during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. You know, to found an organization during a pandemic, think about what that takes and who that kind of a person is. So Southern Solidarity addresses food insecurity and lack of shelter issues faced a long faced in New Orleans by the unhoused population. From the beginning of the COVID lockdown, Southern Solidarity, a grassroots community-based group of volunteers, began preparing and distributing meals, medical resources, and other basic needs. By June of 2020, they were joined by other mutual aid groups and distributed between two to 300 meals a day under the Claiborne I-10 Expressway. And everybody who knows me know how special that place is to me and to all of New Orleans. Additionally, the Southern Solidarity team advocated for increased housing options and successfully demanding, demanded many unhoused people be relocated to local hotels. Southern Solidarity is influenced by anti-imperialist principles, hello, and works to raise the conscious efforts of members and recipients in our collective struggles for liberation. Welcome and thank you, Jasmine. Hello, it's so happy. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so I was diagnosed with cancer two days ago, but I am still here because I think it is necessary to give this talk on future building. And it's humbling. This moment is very humbling for me, um, helping me see myself as just a smaller piece within this larger future building movement. I'm one necessary puzzle piece and you are the other. Um, and I think Martin Luther King saw himself uh, the same way. I want to start with a little passage uh, from a lecture that he delivered only five months before his death. Nonviolent protests must now mature to a new level to respond to heightened black impatience and stifling white resistance. This higher level in a, is mass civil disobedience. There must be more than a statement to the larger society. There must be a force that interrupts its functioning at some key point. Yes. I believe that um, nonviolence is an important tool, but I would love to see nonviolence from our government. That is a government that is not trying to kill its poor and homeless people through austerity measures and neglect. I would love to see nonviolence from our military, which routinely destroys and destabilizes countries abroad. I would love to see nonviolence from police in the form of its absolute abolition. As we engage in future building, it's important to remember that during the end of Martin Luther King's life, he was beginning to evolve his understandings of nonviolence. So what does that mean for us? I think that there is a kind of absurdity in our allegiance to keeping peace while the United States government enacts gross levels of quotidian violence abroad and domestically. 
On any given night, more than half a million people sleep on streets across the United States, most concentrated in cities like New Orleans, New York, Los Angeles. Since the 1980s, various forces have led to the rise of homelessness, escalating housing costs that supersede personal income growth, accelerated loss of affordable housing, austerity measures such as the decline of rental assistance, family support services, mental health services, and drug addiction services. Instead of strengthening these services, which have been proven to help lift people out of unstable circumstances or resolving homelessness through policy changes and regulation, politicians passed legislatures in the 1980s and 1990s, this is during the time of Reagan, that criminalized homeless people. Today, masking austerity measures, blaming people for their situation, and funneling money into the carceral state so that police can control the movements of unhoused people, most of whom are disproportionately Black and Latinx, is common practice. Police, or as I like to call them, violence workers, publicly model a predatory way of relating to homeless people, which is then replicated by the general public. To further compound the situation, the houseless, those most traumatized by class warfare, are rendered sacrificial lamb to unfolding ecological collapse. People in the US fear the recrudescence of Trump and yet the violence and fascism he represents is the very fabric of the US empire and has been since its inception. As we engage in future building, it's important to remember that the past, present and future are all around us every day, which is why we, we conjure up the, the presence of Martin Luther King yearly, annually, daily. It's difficult though for us to conceptualize what it means for the past, present and future to be happening spontaneously at once. Let's try an exercise. Imagine that as you are today, knowing what you know about yourself and knowing what you know about the world, you are awake in the 1900s. You know what 2022 is going to be because you just arrived from there, right? In this scenario, you just wake up in the past, right? But you have a clear conviction of what happened in 2022. You carry an imprint of the future. Now let's imagine a different scenario where you wake up in the year 3000 knowing what you know about the year 2022 because you just came from there. You have an imprint of the past. In this same way, each of us carry an imprint of the past and the future every day. We have a conviction, for instance, that the Haitian revolution did actually occur, that our ancestors fought for their independence in the Caribbean and won. We see around us everywhere evidence that the Haitian revolution did in fact occur, but we also feel the Haitian revolution. Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about structures of feelings or feeling as a source of information, which is undervalued in hegemonic structures when we think about how um, intelligence is, is thought of. We feel in our bodies and our psyche the victory of our ancestors who fought for their liberation and won. We also have a conviction that in the future there will be abolition. If we didn't have an imprint of abolition in our hearts, a map of how to get to abolition, then we wouldn't be writing books or talking about it. We wouldn't believe it is possible, but we do believe that it is possible. Some among us see a future very clearly where there is abolition. As a smaller piece within this uh, future building movement, I've been working uh, in a team called Southern Solidarity. And the Southern Solidarity Network emerged out of a collective understanding that regardless of who is in power, the crisis brought on by capitalism enacts its most vicious violence on the unhoused community. Houselessness is a form of torture. People living outside are subject to extreme variations in weather while oftentimes beset by physiological uh, ailments, poor sleep and little nourishment. Because of this direct relief characterizes much of the organizing work we do. We deliver hundreds of meals, clothing, and medical supplies daily with teams in Volbancha, New Orleans, and New York to alleviate conditions for unhoused people in those areas. The team is called Southern Solidarity because Southern organizing influences all of our work. The South has long been the site of cultural resistance to white supremacy, 
what Ishmael Reed fictionalized as Jess Grew in the no 1972 novel Mumbo Jumbo. From the 1811 slave revolt to Fannie Lou Hamer's FCC to the recent take, down, take him down movement, organizing in the South is shaped by both the delegitimization of white supremacy and an emphasis on the dignity of black and indigenous life in all of its manifestations. Southern solidarity upholds that history by working with healers, musicians, activists, and scholars who pass down this affirmation of the lives and cultures of the dispossessed. Those directing the relief work are black, indigenous, and people of color. Many of us are queer. Some of us have been unhoused or underhoused or formally unhoused or living under precarious situations ourselves. This defies the often repeated refrain that mutual aid is typically organized by the privilege, a refrain that ignores the grassroots care network created by the Black Panthers, by the Lung Yor Lung Young Lords, by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the other Underground Railroad. Our release work began during the first days of the lockdown when it was evident that unhoused people would not be receiving aid, shelter, or information on the pandemic. We went out every day, forged relationships, and then organized with the unhoused to fight for shelter because they are organizing too. After helping to organize a May Day protest calling the government to move the unsheltered into housing during the pandemic, more than 100 people were moved into hotels. When riots erupted across the nation in response to police killings in 2020, our, our network was able to lead some protests. Several of our members were arrested or questioned by the FBI as scare tactic, but we continued to organize and, and resist in the same way that Martin, Martin Luther King organized and resisted. One of the key components of our organizing is that the unhoused are part of the vision building of our relief work and future movement building. They decide what we spend on and train in based on what they say they need. Mutual aid groups are often criticized for, not, for only engaging in care work, which is not inherently radical. Political theorist Joy James explains that the concept of the captive maternal as the, uh, the concept of the captive maternal is when feminized roles of caretaking therein stabilize the very predatory conditions causing the need for the caretaking in the first place. So there isn't really any change happening. And as we mentioned in Martin Luther King's, uh, that first passage that I read, we really need a force that is causing change. So caretakers such as Asada Shakur, for instance, create real ruptures in the form of rebellion, strikes, and riot. They are ruptures because they disrupt the state's mm -hmm. ability. They disrupt the state's ability to further terrorize the poor. Leveraging our power mm -hmm. against systems of oppression need not manifest in ways that are legible to conventional forms of organizing. De-arresting, reclaiming housing without appealing to authorities, blocking housing courts so that evictions are brought to a halt are effective ruptures that can and should be part of any mutual aid tool book. The goal is to strengthen the base enough such that those displaced and severed from the mainstream begin to see, feel, and be a part of and organized with networks guided by visions of socialism. Creating a, a web of emancipatory relations, relationships directed toward autonomy, solidarity, respect, and liberation can help pull us out of this brutal social context so that we can better resist and create ruptures. In an age that confers value through visibility, empty symbolism, and celebrity activism, this is difficult but not impossible. We are after new ways of relating because relation and liberation go hand in hand. No one is free as we future build until we are all free. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And I, I say, I say, I say, um, Southern solidarity is really pushing all of us to lead with love. And that is one of our pillars and as we're manifesting our new way. Please remember to add your questions to the chat and we'll get to them a little later. Our second speaker of the day is Carlton Turner, an award-winning artist, agriculturist, 
researcher and co-founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, that's SIP culture to those who know. He currently serves on the board of the First Peoples Fund, Imagining America, Project South, and the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Additionally, Carlton, along with his brother Maurice Turner, co-founded the Mississippi-based performance art, the performing arts group Mugabe, Men Under Guidance Acting Before Early Extinction. Extinction, hello. In 2018, Carlton was awarded the Sidney Yates Award for Advocacy in the Performing Arts by the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. Carlton, welcome. So good to see you again. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, let me get this thing kicked off so I don't have to deal with the technical issues later. Um, thank you, Sally. Um, I'm gonna keep it brief as I can. Uh, give me one second. All right. Um, so uh, let me know if you can't see me or can't hear or can't see the presentation. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to Jazz Lynn for the, the beautiful presentation and also prayers are with you as you uh, move through this, this moment in your life and dealing with, with cancer. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Choctaw, the Natchez and the Quapaw people. I acknowledge that there were many more tribes of people on this land and on the land that you all rest on as you receive these words today, their names erased by reductionist and revisionist history. It's important to acknowledge them and understand that any work that we are to do in the name of justice, healing, and respect for this planet must start here. Not with just the land acknowledgement, but with active remembrance. Our work begins with engaging the sovereign indigenous people in dialogue and in embracing their leadership. And it's not enough just to say their names. We must also make sure that we work diligently to advance their sovereignty as part of freeing the land and know that they are still here among us. I'm honored to be here and gracious for the invitation to share with you all today. In my formative years, Ashe was a second home for my artistic development. I am thankful for the work of Carol B. Bell and Douglas Red, and for the, the work that Asali and Wood continue in the entire Ashe family for the space you provide for Black liberation. This offering is a talk um, that's done by request from, I'm sure, Demia, but through Wood, from a presentation that I made last summer. Uh, hope it has been edited to hopefully fit within the time allotted today. So don't worry, everything's normal. On January 19th, um, the first COVID case in Shinomis County, Washington, the county is told, the country is told not to worry. The risk of the everyday American is very little. February 12th, back in the other parts of two, 2020, before the country was shut down, I was rolling through the airport, headed to NYC to talk to Elizabeth Alexander. Um, and I remember asking my wife to pick up some masks for me to wear in the airport because this talk of this respiratory disease was making its way around the world. That was before masks and hand sanitizers disappeared from the shelves and stores and before they had both become public identifiers of personal political meanings. February 23rd, Brunswick, Georgia. Ahmaud Arbery was chased down and murdered in the streets in broad daylight while jogging by three white men. February 27th, I was in Minneapolis working with Mina Nathrajan and Deparka Mukherjee of Pangea World Theater on our multi-year cultural exchange project that examines race and identity through the lens of intercultural relationships between Blacks and South Asians. While working in their facility, I was accosted by two members of the Minneapolis Police Department. They said that they were looking for a suspicious black man about my height and around my age. I've been working with Pangea since 2008, and I wish I could say that this was the first time that I had been accosted and harassed by the cops on Lake Street, but it wasn't. It was normal. February 29th, the first COVID death. A 50-year-old man in Washington State is confirmed. March 2nd, the first confirmed COVID case in the Metropolitan area. News of the virus is picking up speed and the world is changing. March 4th, I was back home in Jackson and attending a convening on public health hosted by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The opening plenary featured panelists Nicole Hannah-Jones of the 1619 Project and NAACP President and Mississippian Derek Johnson. The panel was moderated by the foundation's president, Richard Besser. You might know Besser as the CDC director under President Obama. The theme of the conference was racial justice and health, 
a timely and important discussion. But around the globe, the virus was making a serious showing, and you can only imagine the kinds of side conversations that were being held at this public health conference. On day three, Richard Besser addressed a entire group and told folks that they need to make arrangements to return home. The remainder of the conference was suspended, and in less than a week, on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus an outbreak of pandemic. March 13th, Louisville, Kentucky, Breonna Taylor was shot to death while sleeping in her bed by members of the Louisville Metro Police Department. March 19th, California issued the first stay-at-home order. New Jersey shut down on the 21st, followed by New York on the 22nd. Mississippi, as you know, we can be a little slow. You know, the world, we reluctantly shut down on April the 3rd. The American people were asked to pause, to stop the world, to stop doing what we were accustomed to doing every day, getting up, going to work, going to the grocery store, going to school, the restaurant, a bar, a ball game, a yoga class, or church, whatever it is that you do. A totally mobile and interdependent society was asked to segregate into our own individual spaces and stay there. To only leave in case of emergency. This was not normal. But for a lot of people in my community, black and brown people and blue collar white and blue collar white folks, they were considered frontline workers. The people working in warehouses and cleaning and maintenance sections of hospitals, truck drivers and caregivers to our elders. As the world paused and people were asked to shelter in space. These members of our community had to continue moving as their lives dictated before the pandemic to take the risk the rest of the country were being asked to not take and actually not being acknowledged for the sacrifices and the vulnerability nor adequately compensated. These communities of labor are considered at the same time both essential and expendable. So in that respect, it was very much like the America that poor black folks knew very well, completely normal. In the art world, this abrupt halt to life, this making public spaces and crowds taboo, made our work an easy target for cancellation, and the people of our sector extremely vulnerable to the economic realities of pandemic life. The music stopped, and the stage lights went down as venues closed, tours were canceled, and an already inconsistent stream of income was interrupted with no sense of when it would begin again. In this economic high-wire act that is the current arts ecosystem, there was no safety net designed to catch any of us. March 23rd, Daniel Prude died after being restrained by the Rochester police. He was experiencing a mental health and drug addiction crisis. They placed a bag over his head in the middle of the street. That same day, Southern-based arts organization Alternate Roots launched their solidarity fund to support their members with emergency funding. See, this is what it looks like to be first responders in the arts. On March 31st, I met with the founding partners of the Intercultural Leadership Institute, Maria De Leon, president of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, Lori Poirier, president of First Peoples Fund, Vicky Takamini, president of the Pai Foundation in Hawaii, and Michelle Ramos, executive director of Alternate Roots. We met to strategize and respond to what was happening in the art sector and figure out ways to create opportunities for artists and culture bearers to be able to access the support they needed to survive this pandemic. We met with leaders in the philanthropic community to state our needs and make a case for significant investment in the most vulnerable of the art sector. On April 8th, a coalition of national art organizations, including Creative Capital, MAP Fund, and United States Artists launched a $10 million artist relief initiative, $5,000 unrestricted rapid relief grants for artists experiencing COVID relief related emergencies. This initiative was great news for the field. It will provide immediate opportunities for artists to get the emergency support they needed. And we knew that the artists we serve would not have their needs centered through the programs administered by these organizations. See, history had shown us that much. So we didn't see the launching of this program as an answer to the call that we had made collectively to the philanthropic community to make sure that black and brown artists and culture bearers were being considered during this global crisis. We continue to advocate for a pool of funding for our partners to distribute to our communities. On April 10th, Jeff Chang, from his position at Race Forward, initiated a call. He convened Roberta Uno of Art Change Us, Fabiana Rodriguez of the Center for Cultural Power, Maria, Lori, and myself to address the crisis as it was shaping up in our communities. Our first call was on April 28th with the notes from that first meeting becoming the framework for the Cultural New Deal. 
On May 6, the Seattle Indian Health Board, an organization that services the Native American community in King County, was sent body bags and toe tags instead of the COVID medical supplies that they ordered. So now more than that. The first real summer event of the year, but this year is different. And not just because there are no small crowds gathering at homes for beers and backyard barbecues. Memorial Day 2020 might be as significant as the first one 155 years prior because on this day, May 25th, George Floyd is murdered in the streets of Minneapolis. Mere blocks from Pangea's headquarters in broad daylight by police officer Derek Chauvin as three other police officers and a small crowd of witnesses stood by. The filming of this event by 17-year-old Darnella Frazier created the opportunity for the world to bear witness to raw, unbridled abuse of power. The national and global response was immediate, sparking an intense start to the summer with three weeks of national protest. Arts organizations and corporations across the country began to adopt and perform the language of Black liberation, issuing cultural statements and memes of Black solidarity, literally painting the streets with the slogan, Black Lives Matter. The COVID restrictions that kept people inside their homes and out of crowded public spaces was not as important as the people's need to have their voice heard and to put their bodies on the line against the extrajudicial killing of Black people by the police. But police brutality has always been a part of this American life. It's completely normal. I live in Mississippi. And Mississippi history teaches us that all of our governmental and law enforcement systems were integrated with white supremacists and Klan members and members of the White Citizens Council. You know, they arrested and beat Fannie Lou Hamer in Winona, Mississippi in the summer of 1963. She lost vision in one of her eyes and sustained permanent kidney damage because of it. You know, they also killed Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney in Philadelphia, Mississippi in the summer of 64. In Mississippi and across the South, the police were responsible for attacking black folks trying to exercise their right to vote and participate in the de democratic process. And here we are today with a similar moment in which our right to vote is being challenged in state houses and courtrooms across the nation. That's not a coincidence. These laws are being written and perpetrated through white-led conservative think tanks. And if you think it's impossible in this day and age for black folks to lose their right to vote, might I remind you that those rights were taken away in 1890 in Mississippi through what was called a disenfranchising constitution. And if you are a convicted felon, your rights to, be vote, to vote may be taken away today in many states. This is the America that we've always known, and it is completely normal. June 12th. Rayshard Brooks was found sleeping in his car in a Wendy's parking lot. He was later shot twice in the back by Atlanta Police Department after an altercation. Protesters burned the restaurant down. It's July now, and we're beginning to get a lot more data about COVID and how it's disproportionately impacting Black communities. According to Enrique Neblet, a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, in Milwaukee and Chicago, both cities that are approximately 32% Black, they account for more than 70% of COVID deaths. In Georgia, where a third of the population is Black, they accounted for 80% of the hospitalizations. And in Michigan, with only a 14% Black population, which is much closer to the national average, Blacks accounted for 33% of cases and 41% of deaths. Black and brown people aren't dying at disproportionate rates because of COVID. They are dying disproportionately because of a history of inadequate health care and a systemic lack of love and respect for black bodies. On July 16th, we published a cultural deal. After months of weekly meetings, this call was issued to bring an end to racial and cultural inequity and injustice in the arts and cultural sector. This call, which launched with more than a thousand signatures, made an immediate request from the field. The cultural new deal makes plain the need for change. But this is not new, as many black and brown artists have called for these things in the past. The black arts movement, the Chicano arts movement, both of the 60s, voices from the cultural battlefront in the 1990s, the multiculturalism movement, and others have all asked arts community to lead the nation in the type of transformational change needed to fulfill the promise of an America for everyone. Those calls have fallen mostly on deaf ears. These movements have been birthed within the arts as a natural creative response by black and brown artists living in an America that refuses to be inclusive, diverse, and equitable. The arts and culture sector has been an extension of this America. 
inextricably linked to the prejudices and injustices of the greater larger society. So it should come as no surprise that it's people of color and specifically women of color that are driving change in the arts and philanthropic sector and the nation at large. It's women of color, black women, brown women, and indigenous women that are leading the transformation of the larger society. It's because they are the most impacted by the unjust systems that define the rules. Black Lives Matter, a mantra that sparked a global movement was imagined by black women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. The voter registration drives in Georgia that led to turning the state to blue and flipping two conservative Senate seats to black are black women, Stacey Abrams, Latasha Brown, and Malika Redman. Dr. Martin Moreno Vega is leading the charge for the Creative Justice Initiative, the driving force behind the Cultural New Deal, Latina, Indigenous, and Asian American women. Maria De Leon, Lori Poirier, Roberta Uno, Michelle Kumibear, and Dora Taraji. And if we actually believe the image that the art community sells about itself, that we are the harbors of the imagination, that we're the centers of creativity and spaces to make dreams manifest, then can't we be more astute in our understanding that work on our stages, the artists we support with funding and resources, the ideas we uphold are all directly connected to the world we manifest five, 10, 20 years from now? Can we be more intentional in holding space for the collective and strategic transformation of our sector? We must remake our arts and cultural spaces into our collective vision of the world we all deserve and be the model that works to change everything it touches. We must listen to and place our faith in the leadership of Black, Brown, and Indigenous women. It's their time. It has been for a long time. Our refusal to acknowledge this moment means a return to normal, and normal is not enough. It never has been. On August 27th, the Mellon Foundation supported the Ely Partners with a $5 million gift to support our collective regranting to individual artists and small arts organizations. September 4th, President Trump bans federal agencies from participating in racial sensitivity training related to critical race theory and denied the existence of, of systemic racism. November 2nd, more than 150 million Americans turn out to vote in the presidential election the largest voter turnout in history. November 18th, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves proposes a patriotic education fund to reverse the far less socialist indoctrination. January 6th. March 26th, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signs an extremely restrictive voting bill into law behind closed doors anchored by three white men on both sides and a picture of a plantation behind him in the center as a response to a state turning blue in November and the election of two Democratic senators in January. Meanwhile, outside, Rep Rep Representative Park Cannon, a black woman, was arrested as she tried to confront him. June 2021, 20, Texas bans the teaching of critical race theory in schools. So what art will shape the 21st century? Our work at the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production is to work to recalibrate the measurements by which economic prosperity are calculated, and in the process, redefine the wealth for our rural community. We're taking an intergenerational approach to community and cultural economic development through the lens of cultural and agricultural production, shifting the community from consumer to producer. As a co-founder and lead artist of Sip Culture, it's my opinion that the most important art we can support and create is the byproduct of a community culture that embodies health and wellness as collective practice. The fruits that will grow from these roots will be the indicators of what it means to be healthy and whole, sustainable, accessible, and indistinguishable from other aspects of community life that celebrate love, abundance, and imagination. We believe the future of arts is working in the margins. Our work is not defined by genre, or ticket sales, but by our ability to imagine ourselves at the blurry markets where ideas are required and where questions still remain. Our work is to engage the community of residents and our network of artists in the collective design process to reconfigure our community to be responsive to change and transformation by making our process of listening available to whoever needs our ears. We're listening for understanding, connection, we're listening for the prompts that will cue the next iteration of curatorial processes necessary to identify the types of expertise needed to coerce a creative solution from the myriad of critical challenges we face. We're not driven by innovation. 
we are driven by the call and response. In a place where black genius has often been dismissed and extinguished, we realize that many of the solutions we are seeking can already be found in the recollection of what our communities have accomplished. Our future lies in the stories of our elders. Together, in conversation with the imagination of our youth, they create the blueprint to a life defined by purpose, reason, and joy. In a world driven by individual achievement, this could be the most challenging work we face as a nation. We know there are no easy solutions. There are no series of action steps that will get us to where we need to be. What it takes to change the cultural fabric of our communities, that's the answer. Keep doing, keep working, keep making, keep listening, responding. Make a conscious decision to pursue the work that can only be found at your own growing edge. Celebrate life in any and all aspects of your work. Pause to rest and rejuvenate, then do it all again. Ask tough questions that require critical thinking and complicated nuanced answers. Support the art that requires the commitment of embodiment rather than just the skill of performance. Begin and end in generosity and love harder than you ever thought you were capable of. The yield from this process will be the most important art our world has ever imagined and will shape the remainder of the 21st century. If we actually believe the image the art community sells about itself, that we are the harbors of the imagination, that we are the centers of creativity and spaces to make dreams manifest, then we must listen to and place our faith in the leadership of Black, Brown, and Indigenous women. If we actually believe these things, we must place our trust in the leadership of Black, Brown, and Indigenous women. We must place our trust and faith in the leadership of black, brown, and indigenous women. It's their time, has been for a long time. Our refusal to acknowledge this moment means return to normal. And normal ain't enough. It never has been, and it never will be. Ooh, um, thank you so much, Carlton. I mean, you know, at this moment, I can't help but uplift the two pillars that state we are healthy, we are valued. As we soak up and reflect the great work of SIP culture, and after Carlton's um, talk and after Jasmine's talk, I'm, I'm so thoroughly um, filled with emotion. Um, and I want to reiterate that we live long and well. Health disparities along racial lines do not exist. Our pain is believed. Our health care is thorough and exemplary. And along those lines, I want to take a moment for those of us who are gathered here to respect the contribution and sacrifice that Jasmine has made to be with us in this moment, to offer our own um our own contribution to her health care, beginning with a spiritual space. And I'd like to ask Sunny, our healer on deck, to please come on and um, share some healing words for Jasmine that we all who are gathered here can participate in. Yeah. Jasmine, Jasmine, Jasmine. Um, just to, to hear you, um, and you so quickly glossed over that, uh, you know, what you said, you said, I was diagnosed with cancer two days ago, but it was important for me to be here, right? Um, and it's something because, yes, it speaks so much to your strength. It also speaks to your vulnerability. So right now, what we just want to do is virtually, and I'm saying virtually, yes, but at the same time, we understand as we've been um, taught, as you graciously uh, brought up this aspect of past, present, and future, and how these times merge all as one. So even this moment, this present moment is still something that is present, right? So um, even your experience of this cancer, um, really what we are doing as a collective, and certainly as this group of artists and this group of, of, of spiritualists in this way that we are, we're already envisioning these, these cells leaving going about their business, <laughs> getting out of your body. But I'm also reminded, um, it's something about cancer. And 
you know, one expression of cancer is really complete freedom. So it really speaks to your yearning for this aspect of freedom. Why would why would cancer represent this aspect of complete freedom? Because cancer cancer cells obey nobody. <laughs> they start, they multiply. They don't they don't care about what else is happening. They're like, we coming, we coming. This is it. This is it. This is it. Right. And so what can happen is that it's such this um, yearning for freedom, but it's freedom in the wrong direction. How often have we gone in the wrong direction? Right. So this is also a call for us, for all of us, because yes, this is happening to you. You're experiencing it, but we're all experiencing it because you are ours. We're all experiencing it. We're all, we're all impacted by it. We all have someone who has had to go through this experience of these cells multiplying and, and, and moving and claiming space and not paying rent in the space <laughs> that they are in. So really this is a call for all of us um, to soften into one another even more, to soften um, into our hearts even more, to, to balance this aspect of head, heart, gut, and feet so that we truly can create, as the prayer says, right, on earth as it is in heaven. So now we're thinking about really, what is our heaven? In the heaven of our heads, what really am I thinking about myself? What am I thinking about my work? There's so much work that you do around this aspect of housing, and unhousing. Now here it is. You are called to do the most beautiful and most important work, which is to unhouse that which needs to be unhoused, right? From your own body, from your own heart, from your own mind and breast and, and, and ovary and wherever else these things tend to reside. We're all standing with you. We're all supporting you. We're all lifting you up. So that as you go through this, this experience, oh my God, that you know that there are people around you who love you, who are supporting and lifting. I, I can't say this enough because it's quite often we're doing this work and we don't always see the real support, the, the support that we need, right? We're such a support system for so many other people in the world and in our quiet moments. There's the still small voice that kind of comes up and says, and where is my support? Where is my support? Where is my support? And here we're all whispering back to you. We're here. We're here. We're here. We're here. We're right here. And then we're calling and commanding every cell within you to also say, and we are here. We are here. We are here. We are here. Supporting, lifting, loving, honoring, divining every aspect of yourself and every aspect of your body. We're so grateful for you, Jasmine. So grateful that um, you're able to be here, that you, it's not even that you put this thing aside, but it is that you put it inside of all of us so that you have even more strength, that we can also be more of your muscle during this time, um, that anywhere you look and anywhere you turn, truly, it's blessings, 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 wherever you turn, in the dark moments, blessings, in the low moments, blessings, in the high moments, blessings. So this is just for you to recognize and see that you have a full community of people, people you have never probably seen before, but we're all here supporting and honoring, knowing that there's nurturing that needs to be there. So here's to you to take your time to nurture yourself in the process, to take the time to love up and hug up on yourself in the process. Some things that maybe you haven't, you haven't taken the time to do. So now, you know, this work, is really here to support you. You've done a lot to support the work and to support hundreds of people. So now here we have these people that are really, that are lined up to support you in this process as well. So we're giving thanks for your body. Thanks for the strength. Thanks for 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 uh, the expertise that it has. Mama Jamila, who's here, she's one who would say that even though doctors, doctors may be an authority, but you are the expert of your body. So here's to tapping into even more of your expertise, your expert healing practice, your expert healing command that you can command and demand all of these cells to come into alignment with your one and highest thought.
the most beautiful thought there is, and that is to heal. And we know that to heal is to make whole. So here's to your wholeness. Here's to your healing. Here's to the wholeness and healing of all of us and all of the people in our family. You're standing as an example for us and for people in our family, for members who have come through and who have um, made their transitions and all of these kind of things. You're standing as an example for that and how great it is to be um, you know, a pillar and a mirror um, during this time. So we're grateful for you. We're honoring you yet again. I can't say that enough. We're honoring you. We're honoring you. We're honoring every part of you that knows how to heal itself. So here's to speaking to those. Question. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you um, again, Jasmine. And thank you, Carlton. I mean, you both just, you know, kind of put it all out on the field, right? Um, you know, all of yourselves, all of your um, past and your ancestry, all of your hopes for the future, all of your intentions, all of your work and your energy. Like, and um, I'm just so thoroughly impressed by both of your um, by both of your talks because you can tell how to use um, Jasmine's phrase feeling as a source of information, right? Like your emotional intelligence beyond, you know, your just logistical brilliance um, really shown through. And, um, you know, I just want to speak on behalf of everyone who I know heard your words, um, how we have been changed and inspired by them. Um, so I wanna offer that gratitude. Um, and so on that note, what was really present for me in, um, in both of your talks, Jasmine said it explicitly in Carlton, um, you evoked it in many different ways, right? But what, what are we to do now, right? Um, in terms of, there, there is a, um, blatant, a, a blatant need that we can see for disturbing the peace, right? Um, Jasmine said there's, you know, no sense, I don't remember the exact Dr. King um, quote, but no sense in maintaining um, peace when, you know, we're in a society dedicated um, to violence and violating and oppressing us. Um, so with the emotional intelligence that you have, what is our strategy? Because I've been thinking about this a lot too, like especially with the voting rights thing. I'm like, it's time again for us to, as a, en masse, to put our bodies on the line, right? Um, to get back out there and disturb the peace like Fannie Lou Hamer disturbed the peace. Um, and what's our 2022 strategy though um, for meeting the violence that we are exposed to um, in a way that does not... Um, in a way that honors um, our humanity. And so that's that's open to either of you. I think um, it's so important to bring in our ancestors because our ancestors have already shown us the way in more ways than one through books, through their own actions, through their own organizations. We have the Black Panthers, the, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords. We have Harriet Tubman. We have so many examples. And I feel like when in moments of despair that we should always turn back to those readings, to that history and feel again that we are in the past, present and future all all at once. Um, and I think uh, leveraging our power against systems of oppression is going to look like us not just protesting, so not just conventional forms of organizing, but also getting in front of the housing courts and blocking uh, those evictions from happening, saying no at every small and every small moment of your life where you see that they, there is a moment to resist, whether it be at work or with your family, when you see that you can support uh, resistance, that you can support the lives of other people, support the lives of trans people, of Black women, of, of queer folks um, across the board. When you see a chance to do that, you say, uh, you do it. And that is a revolution in and of itself. And then we we bring that out into the world um, through mass strikes, through, like I mentioned, reclaiming housing, through de-arresting, um, through, through bringing things to a halt that need a halt, through creating ruptures. 
Excellent. I, the, I, I love the um, resistance measures. And I just want to ask, because I don't know, and I think maybe some others may not know, um, what is de-arresting? Yeah, we actually saw this in New Orleans during a protest. A woman called the police because someone got shot at a park. And when the police arrived, they arrested the woman who called the police. Naturally, they didn't ask any questions. They just arrested her. Um, and so uh, a crowd of protesters who were pr luckily protesting just across the street um, uh, surrounded the police car and they brought a lawyer over to speak to the police and they did not move until the police listened to that lawyer and helped remove the woman from the car. It's possible. De-arresting is possible. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'll be talking to you uh, later about that I want to get deeper. Um, but in the meantime, Carlton, can you share your thoughts? Yeah, I appreciate everything Jasmine had to, to add in that. I, I would just add um, one one small thing, which is, you know, um, there's, this work is made possible for you. All the things that we've referenced uh, is because of organizations, because there's, you know, we have to align ourselves with others that are um, you know, our strength lies in our ability to collectively uh, organize and strategize uh, and that the solutions that we're thinking of collectively are different from our in individual survival instincts. They're part of a collective framework for like community and collective liberation. So uh, I can't uh, stress the, the, the power of organization, um, you know, and that doesn't mean 501c3 institutions, you know, whatever, it just means that we have to be in space with each other. We have to commune with each other and work together to build the type of solidarity needed to be able to stand in the face of, of, of to be able to resist together and, and find that safety in each other. Um, that was just a core element of the civil rights movement um, was, was the, the amount of time that they spent building relationships. Um, and those relationships carried them through uh, many a dark night and, and, and many a billy club and, and many a confrontation. So, um, again, looking back at those, the blueprints that have already been laid and, and, and gathering our strength and intelligence uh, and strategies from learning and, and remembering. So you touched on something, right? Um, you know, there's so many of us who are doing this work of um, institution building. And when I think about um, Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King and, you know, how they interacted, right? Like as just one seeing what the other one was doing and saying, good work, I got you kind of thing. Um, and also recognizing that much of this work can't happen inside of the nonprofit industrial complex, right? Like we have um, a responsibility to build inside of this 501c3 space to get as many resources and opportunities for our people as possible. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to the kind of organizing and work that can't happen in this space. How do we, how, how do we weave those threads? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, understanding uh, tools. I'm a, I'm a farmer, you know, I, I work, I work, you know, both farm and construction. And um, the value of having the right tool for the right uh, moment and the right job is, 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 is just lovely. Like, you know, so understanding the role of a 501c3 organization, understanding the role of a faith-based institution, understanding the role of a, of a school board, a community school board, understanding the tools and how they can be leveraged. It's, it, listen, our ancestors said by any and all means necessary. So you don't leave anything on the table. We have to figure out how to use the tools for, the, for, for what we need them to do. Um, and, and the 501c3 structure is a tool. It's not, it, it, it's, not, it's not a tool for liberation. Mm -hmm. It's a tool for the management of resources. Yes. So understand that, use it for that. But the liberation tools are, are those community, those co cultural organizing tools, the spiritual practices, the faith-based institutions. But those are the spaces that we have to be in and we have to understand how those places leverage our collective uh, needs. Uh, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's just the work 
again, we got to do the work. It's it's not this doesn't happen by thinking about it or having good intentions. Yeah. It happens by putting your your shoulder to the to the to the to the wheel and pushing. Um, and we that's the work we got to do. And I think too, when when we see it in that way that you so beautifully put it in, then we begin to see how, again, I bring it back to this idea of a puzzle piece. When we have all the puzzle pieces, we're more effective. So if this organization is focused on um, uh, housing tool, using all the housing tools and this other organization is focused on working with unhoused people and those two organizations come together, then we have more tools at our disposal and we learn from each other. And it also seems to me that with a strategy like that, the opportunities to create the ruptures that you spoke of would be much more um, prevalent, right? Like um, it would expand our vision um, exponentially. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I have a question and look, y'all folks that's in the uh, comments and all of that stuff, Y'all bet you y'all know me, so you know I'm. I'm a, <laughs> and these are two of the most beautiful and intriguing people. So if y'all don't put in a question, it's gonna be all me. Um, but how are you guys? You know, we're talking about this relationship stuff, and um, and and we're talking about this ancestral stuff, and we're moving in a space where, and I say, um, that you know, we we want to make more real our diasporic work and our partnerships in the diaspora how are you seeing your work as you know um you know reaching beyond the the american the southern the um northern hemisphere the western philosophy borders um that we're operating inside of so Southern Solidarity, actually, the name is derived from the team was discussing an appropriate name for um, our group. And we came up with Southern Solidarity because we are conjuring the global South, not just the South in America, although the South in America is very important to how the style of organizing that we use. And we're definitely working with those ancestors from the South, but we are evoking the global South and we make connections. We try to make connections around the world to other people's to other organizations, we have speakers from other parts of the world come to speak to us so that we strengthen um, this understanding that it's a global resistance movement and that we're all stronger together. Yeah, I would just speak to, um, you know, I, I feel like my entire adult life has been about exploring relationships with people that don't look like me, don't eat the same food I eat, don't come from my community, um, that those are in those, the study of those relationships, the advancing and building of those relationships is where I actually find the parts of myself that I didn't even know existed. Uh, and, and, I, and I feel that way about the work we do with Civ Culture. We're in partnership with, uh, again, the, the, um, the Intercultural Leadership Institute. We're you know, co-founders of that space where we literally spend our time training uh, and creating space for people to um, move through both real and imagine uh, cultural barriers to find out how to organize and strategize together for collective liberation. That, so that's that's a that's a strong tenet, and I think the work that I'm really that is really important to me to sip culture, and and I think is a continuation of the hallmark of what I learned um, in my years. You know, coming back and forth and working with people like uh, John O'Neill and and Carol B. Bell and Kalamu Yasalam and and the folks in, in New Orleans and. The folks here with you know Dave Dennis and and, and um, Bob Moses, you know their vision was never um, you know uh, it wasn't tunnel vision about the the one thing they were working on. It was understanding again back to Jasmine's puzzle piece. It was like this is a piece. Once if we can get this piece set, we can work on these other pieces, and and, and then we're going to have this larger um, puzzle put together. And so I think it's just key. Um, and I saw you know all the work I say doing down in Puerto Rico. You know, we've been down there. Um, Civ Culture made a visit down there a couple of years ago uh, to visit with some some agriculturalists on the island um, that are running and, and reappropriating their, um, their ancestors' property into community cultural centers. So we're seeking out those type of organizations and individuals that are doing work that is in solidarity with the work that we're doing here because we know we have a lot to learn um, from, especially from those that are operating outside of, of uh, the, um, the American borders. Um, the, yeah. outside of the continental United States. 
Um, we also have taken trips to, to India to, to work with farmers in India. So all of this is, is really important to our understanding of who we are and how we, how we can advance liberation. Well, yeah. And, you know, an ability to see how other folks are putting those tools in action, because when we were in um, Puerto Rico and spending time um, in Louisa with those folks and seeing how they made and, you know, demanded and maintained space and how they're taking over the schools and how they're reacting to the austerity measures, um, you know, that are being, I mean, ravaged, you know, and savagely um, enforced upon them is very inspiring, both um, to our own work and to our impetus to add to their work, right? Um, and, and with that being said, like, you know, one of the tools that I'm, you know, trying to really learn how to develop and um, just because I'm, you know, uh, you talked about the magic of Black women and, you know, one of the things that we do, you know, we forge ahead. Um, and so, and I know that in sometimes in that forging, you know, we can often, you know, lose the space for others to lead. And one of the things, Jasmine, I noted about um, how you manage your organization, you know, you made space for the unhoused, right? The people who you are serving to also um, be leaders, you know, how, what were your strategies around that? Yeah, so a lot of the decisions that we make are in Southern Solidarity are determined by what unhoused people say they need. And focusing on need is one way that we involve unhoused people in this creation of, of autonomy for themselves. For instance, if unhoused people um, say that they have a specialized need around um, drug use, then we fill those needs and get the necessary training. And so they've essentially decided what we train in based on what they say they need. They say they need, um, you know, clothing, then we organize for a project to be focused on getting folks clothing as efficiently as possible. So in this way, they shape the, or uh, the organization of Southern Solidarity. Well, that's certainly a lesson that many organizations um, could take their leave from. Um, so Carlton, with that in mind, you know, you do so much economic development in your community. Um, tell, tell me about that and tell me like, what are the opportunities for leadership, you know, in a community, in an economic development initiative? And, and, we, and we know those women in Mississippi, you know, are making their voices heard, right? <laughs> better believe it. Better believe it. Um, so the work that we're doing right now is, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, provide training uh, for, for young black farmers uh, and um, to increase the number of, of fresh produce and fr fresh food producers in our community. Uh, I live in a community that my family's been in for eight generations. And growing up, you know, we, we got 85 to 90% of the food that we ate came from our property. You know, it came from the yard. Um, and you fast forward, you know, 35 years and this, same community that was literally constructed around agriculture uh, has to go to a Dollar General to get groceries. Mm. So there's a, there's a real shift and change that has happened. Uh, and that has been both economic, that has been cultural, it's been spiritual. Um, and so much of it has had to do with decisions that are made from outside of our community. Um, so our work um, is not about economic development. Economic development is a byproduct of what we consider to be uh, the agency building that we're doing by, by re-establishing social cohesion in our community. The, the type of social cohesion that will allow our community to make the kind of decisions they need to make to be self-determined. And right now, the, the work is in, in our farm. So without, without a grocery store you know, in our local community, what we've been doing this year is just establishing a place where we can grow food and where we can get that food to the community. So we, uh, last year, we trained young farmers and, and created an elder share program in which we, um, you know, worked with, with community uh, seniors uh, over the age of 60 that either had transportation issues or economic issues or just could not, you know, resource groceries to provide them five to seven pounds of groceries, um, you know, twice a week um, for an eight week period. So we were able to move about two tons of food that we grew in our sustainable space. Um, and we're training young farmers to do that growing and to, to, to build those relationships with the community, to, to recognize where there's a need and to begin to build infrastructure to fill that need. So that basic need is no longer a need. It's just a, it's just a reality. Like 
we shouldn't have to wonder where our food is coming from because we know how to grow food and we got land to grow food. So those shouldn't be issues. So that's the way that we're approaching it. We're in the process now of, of development uh, of a building. We have a 4,000 square foot building on Main Street that we're developing into um, a, a kitchen, FDA approved community kitchen uh, and community so cultural places. center. And, you know, so much of our work, we model from our learning from Ashe. And I, and I say that with earnesty, like, you know, the, I, New Orleans was our spot. Me and my brother stayed down there. We were always there. John O'Neill was, was, you know, just a, a deep mentor. Uh, Carol B. Bell, so many folks there. And we just were there all the time and learning and watching and looking at, the, you know, especially in the aftermath of Katrina, uh, when we just saw the way that um, Ashe was able to not shift, um, but just take its rightful place as, as a conduit for community reconstruction. You know, and, and that that the art practice was the practice of reimagining how our community could be different and not have to go through these issues again. And, and I think that's the work that we that we learn from, we get inspired by and we continue to try to replicate. You know, um, you touched right on the thought that was in my head when you said go through these issues again, because, you know, it can't help but be stark to me, you know, that you're working on food and housing justice, <laughs> right? Like these are things that should not be an issue today. Like, you know, there's there's abundance, <laughs> you know. Um, so there are structures in place that make this necessary, even beyond our own agency, right? Like, you know, so yes, we work on personal agency, you know, all, all day long and, you know, build it, amplify it um, and, and all that that means. But we're at a crossroads now. Um, well, you know, I mean, it always have been, you know, really like, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, it's it, it feels a little more now, but we've never been out of this crossroads, you know, where um, we are subject to so many things outside um, of our control that should be in our control, that we're told we have a right to control, um, you know, by the governing doctrines. Um, what are the places of advocacy? What are the pressure points and leverage points to get put forth the kinds of policies that we need um, so that your organizations could shift to other work. Not that you wouldn't be needed, because of course you'll still be needed. I don't, I don't that question where people say, well, you know, what would you have to do to make your work not necessary? Your work will always be necessary. But, you know, in order for you to be able to shift to the next level, um, you know, of, you know, redefining and um, reimagining humanity, um, what, what would those laws be? Phew. Policy, policy work. Um, so, you know, for us, it's here, it's, um, you know, this may not be the answer you're looking for, but this is the answer I got. <laughs> um, we look at our work as being a place where our community can bring its dreams, like literally crafting a physical and um, and spiritual space for the community to, to have, to, to be, to, to imagine what life can be. I think, um, you know, laws, there's so many laws. There's literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of laws and every level of our lives is governed by intersecting and, and concentric sets of laws. I don't know that we need more laws. I don't know that we need, you know, that we need another law to say that we should have the right to vote. To me, it's ridiculous that that should be legislation, that we have to pass legislation to give us the right to, to vote and have a but say yeah, in our lives. Even if you don't need more laws, you need to take some of them out, though, right? Like, we have to, mm -hmm. we can't just, Yeah, we need less. We absolutely yeah. need less. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. There's, but, there's work that needs to be done in the advocacy and policy arena. Uh, I think what I want to get to, though, is that our communities are so disconnected, the same way that we're disconnected from the source of our food, we're disconnected from the source of the of the policies and the spaces that govern our lives. Mm -hmm. And so the re-engagement of that as those spaces as first spaces and not mm -hmm. as I only go to that space when there's something that I want to fuss about. But they're the space that I go to because I want to craft what my liberation looks like. And, and so that's a shift. That's a fundamental shift in the way that we think about those spaces. So I don't know if I have a, an answer to that question, but I think about it often um, and, and want to engage more in policy and advocacy work 
Um, but I, right now that work I do, I do in partnership with people who specialize in those areas. Yeah, and I think it's when we ask a question like that, we kind of should step back and think, well, where, where was the policy changed at any point? And I think if we look specifically um, at the points during the Reagan years, we see a complete dismantling of the housing landscape, right? And so building, kind of going backward and building back all of the the regulations that were in place against corporations, the, the housing laws that were in place like Section 8, strengthening those programs that were taken away from us during the Reagan years, um, like the drug addiction programs, um, can really build our community back up. And then uh, removing things like the carceral state, which target poor people and further destabilize them. And I think that's how we begin to, to build the base. And again, I don't think that kind of stuff is going to happen until we organize together, like Carlton was saying, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's the, the basis of it all, right? We have to organize together. We have to act together. We have to implement <laughs> together and we have to see ourselves as together, right? Um, you know, one of the things I've been noticing, you know, um, in, in the work lately, um, you know, are these divisions between um, people who perceive, so like they often we'll get people of the civil rights movement generation to say, oh, these BLM folks are, you know, and, and they mean that in a very general sense, not, you know, people who belong specifically to the Black Lives Matter movement, but just, you know, young folks who they associate with that. You know, oh, they think they're doing something. And it's like, man, come on now, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna put pit one generation of the movement against another generation of the movement. It's one movement, right? Like we, um, you know, from, it's all abolition, uh, right? Um, so while we're doing this very hard work, while we are still doing this hard work inside of America where we're always tempted um, to the pit divide, um, be better than, think of ourselves as ex more exceptional than other people. Um, what are the strategies that we could embed inside of our work and inside of our organizations to, um, you know, to lessen the impact of that, you know, social, pressure to let ego lead. Jasmine, I, I, I've been talking a lot, so I'm, I'll yield. Um, I'm trying to talk less because I just had surgery. So if you want to start, that's so fine. Um, so I think uh, I think the, the work is uh, connected to what Jasmine was just talking about. Like we're, there's there's policies that have changed and shift the way that we, our, our community dynamics. So I'll speak again about Utica. It's a community that used to be a thriving, uh, a very thriving little rural town. It had all the amenities, grocery stores, doctor's office, dentist's office, you know, hardware store, the whole nine. Um, and And business and profit made decisions guide that 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 impacted the development of the community um and those decisions weren't made by people who live in the community so there's this disconnect um from 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 the positions of power over our own destiny like we don't we don't we're not involved or engaged in the decisions about our future and to me that is there's the fight uh, this past present and future there's the there's the ongoing you know, legacy work that we have to be engaged in. And we also have to be of double consciousness to be building the thing that we want to see simultaneously. Like that can't be something that we wait to do after we dismantle this thing. We got to be working to build as we're, as we're also chipping away at the things that no longer serve us. Like, um, and that's just the way that we have to approach it. And I think the intergenerational piece um, and listening to each other allows us to, 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 to dismantle some of those divisions that we have based on this movement versus that movement versus the women's liberation versus the blah, 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 versus all of that stuff is all about liberation. So how do we, how do we understand where we connected and how we can work to, to strengthen each other versus how can we take from that and build over here? Yeah. And with that question, I think a lot about the Caribbean thinker Glissant and um, say the name again for me. Glissant. He wrote um, poetry of, uh, poetics of relation. Mm 
And so in Proetics of Relation, he talks about how what, what we really need to change at the core and in order to get away from this hegemonic society, what we really need to change is the way we relate to each other. And so what does that look like? What does it mean to relate? Um, how, what does it mean to relate both to the land, to the environment around us and to each other? That is where the shift ha has to happen. We need to shift towards more of a care oriented way of looking at the world um, instead of trying to box things um, up. And I think in organizing that will really help with our mental health and in feeling more unified. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Because I know one thing that plagues my mental health um, you know, I, I have these existential fears around climate, right? And, um, you know, often thinking like you, you if, if any of you are Game of Thrones folks, right? Like we up here fighting over these humanly things and the White Walkers coming to, you know, wipe us all out. I feel like climate is the White Walker, right? right. Uh, um, and so I've been working to, you know, integrate this um, liberation work, this community development, place making, place keeping work with, you know, climate justice work, and you know, with both of you, your, you know, your work being so intimately um, tied to that. Um, and as I know, we're, you know, um, coming up on our um, in ending of our time. I would love for you to share your thoughts um, around that. And I, I kind of want to end on Jasmine's voice and words. Um, so Carlton, if you don't mind first. Sure, yeah. Um, so for me, uh, the, you know, the climate work is, it's the ongoing legacy. I mean, and it's, it's, so, it's so deeply entrenched in, in this capitalist model um, that just is about extraction. Um, and in that we have to, we have to be acting in ways in which we're uh, we're we're building and we're creating and we're we're investing in and and building and regenerative agriculture, regenerative uh, press, uh, community relationships. The regenerative space is where we have to be working in all of our. It has to be the framework shift that we take to all of our work. Um, and and so, what are we putting into it? What are we investing in the future of the work, in the moment, and in the future of it? Um, so um, I think I have to you know just uplift. Uh, Colette, P Colette Pichon Battle and the work mm -hmm. of the Gulf, Gulf South or Green New Deal. Um, they're doing like mass amazing work uh, in the climate area around the South. Um, and if folks don't know about it, get connected. Colette is a, is a powerhouse and uh, from down in Slidell. Uh, so yeah, um, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll just end with this last thing. You know, when I got the invitation back in, I think it was maybe September, it was a long time ago from, from Wood, um, I was like, yeah, I get to come back to our shade. We're going to have lunch. It's going to be good food. I'm like, when he sent me that thing about the virtual, here's the virtual. I was like, what? We're not going to. So um, I look forward I'm to being I'm a Marianne. Yeah. I'm a Rosa dancing all Yeah, and Jasmine, it's such a pleasure to meet you, and I will continue to look and uh, watch your work. And Carlton, we will see you in person soon because yeah. we will we will make a visit. Um, come get some of all of that Mississippi brother and sisterhood that we share with um, New Orleans. Thank you so so much, Jasmine. Yeah, and I want to end on the note. Um, you know, we're we're talking a lot about climate change. We're talking a lot about the environment, and I think what is so important is that we continue to fight vigorously for that people to be housed for people to be housed during this time as climate change worsens we really need to make sure that people are not on the street as these storms are happening because that is what is happening right now people are on the street experiencing hurricane ida um and i, I don't think enough people are thinking you know when they shelter from a storm that there are people who cannot or who decide not to go to a shelter for many many reasons of, of previous trauma that are valid um and so i think really working in the housing to working within housing to push and make changes is crucial as we build our base right people need to be in homes in order to fight with us mm -hmm. right um and so i think that's really important and then i'm going to leave everyone with some reading materials i feel like if you're if you ever feel moments of despair uh reading is is really what helps um as long as, as, as not as long alongside doing the work and so Joy James is a great um, black theorist, political theorist to be reading. Um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has great thoughts on abolition and Claudia Jones brings us, brings us right back to 
the root of socialism, um, which is really important, I think, to, to be learning right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those resources and we'll make sure to get them um, to all of you along with some more information about the work that Carlton and Jasmine are doing and ways that you can um, be supportive of their work um, with your contribution of time and resources as you have them um, and, and energy. Please uh, be aware, you know, that in addition to money, which we need lots of, in addition to time and putting your hands on things at the same time, our, our work also needs um, the collective goodwill um, and good energy of all of us out here. Um, this has been an amazingly special afternoon. Um, I think that we cross the virtual barrier um, with ease and um, brought people into a personal space. And so I thank you both for that tremendously. Thank you to everyone um, who contributed to the space with your um, time, attention, with your ears and that energy that we spoke of. Um, I love y'all. Um, and, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart and from the wide expanse of my soul. I hope that you join us tomorrow evening for the MLK exhibit, The Gift of Love, and um, on Monday for our health fair, come get your booster if you haven't gotten it already, come get tested, come get your blood pressure checked and all of that good stuff. And it's going to be cold, but we'll have lots of heating elements, so I don't want to hear nothing about I couldn't get my booster because it was too cold. So all of you who said, I'm not getting a booster unless I shade do the booster, we're doing the booster, we're going to have the DJ, we're going to have food, all that stuff y'all want, so come get protected. Um, Ashe, have a beautiful rest of your afternoon. Ashe. Ashe. You're on mute, Wood. Look, I, I'm so, I was so moved and nourished by what y'all were saying. I, I didn't turn my, my mic on. And you know, that's not, not something I normally mess up with. But uh, giving thanks to, uh, to all of you all for, uh, for being with us. Um, I'm going to let Mama G come on in a minute and tell us who was the winner of our um, raffle. But in the meantime, let me also offer us, you know, as I always tend to do, a little art. Sister, uh, well, let me give it up for free for real. Oh, and there's a question. What venue on North Roman Street did Dr. King deliver a speech during his first visit to New Orleans? All right. Some of y'all might know this. Some of y'all got y'all good Google fingers. Uh, while y'all answer that question, Check out this video from uh, from Free For All.
Yes. Giving thanks for free uh, for providing us with that uh, that interlude. For if you don't know free, uh, New Orleans based string player plays all the strings: cello, violin, viola, guitar. Obviously, uh, composer, filmmaker, interdisciplinary artist. Just uh, an artist that has a singular voice and focus, driven by desire for justice and equity. That's that's free, y'all, and uh, hence the name Free Fall. Uh, we give thanks for uh, sending that video. I told Free what the what the theme of the day was. Free was like, I got a song that's about banging your head against the wall till you ain't got no more Fs to give. And I was like, all right. That sound like sound like something we could definitely work with. So giving thanks to Free. Uh, Mama J, how you feel? Go on, get yourself off mute and get on in here. I'm doing really good. I want to thank Carlton and Jasmine for just bringing so much to us today, um, opening so many doors and windows in our minds so that we can see that we are the power. We are the power, each and every one of us. None of the movements that we stand on today happened unless one person first had a dream and then began to move to execute that dream by adding two, three, and then a whole motion. I see. So you today can make a new normal, not normal. But my job today is to uh, introduce the um, winner. But first we wanna talk about the questions. First question was, what organization did Dr. Martin Luther King help? We said help to co-found at New Zion Baptist Church in New Orleans. And that answer is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And when we say helped, other Baptist ministers from New Orleans were an integral part of that. But it was done over at the New Zion Baptist Church, which is still located at the corner of Third and LaSalle. You may have passed that many times and not realized its history. Second question, 
And we asked in a question about uh, Brother Shavaz. And let's see. I saw Sonny say something about glasses earlier. I didn't put mine on. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> which two organizations merge to form the United Farm Workers Local uh, Labor Union? That was a union between. Remember that one and joining to make it make that this? OK, let's go. That was a joining between the National Farm Workers Organization and the Agricultural Workers Organizations Committee. This was not only a joining of those two aggregate um, organizations, but of two people of different ethnicities with the same issues. The Mexican grape pickers and the Filipino grape pickers. And they saw their like need and they came together and became a force that changed why I might eat grapes today. <laughs> And our third question, what venue on North Roman Street did Dr. King deliver his speech during his first visit to New Orleans? And that answer is the Coliseum Arena. And just a little personal note, when Dr. King was here in the city, my uncle, John C. Raphael Sr. was his bodyguard and he was the first black detective in New Orleans, Louisiana. I see. So let's see, let's see that wonderful wheel and see if we can see who won. Bringing up the wheel. And as we're bringing up the wheel, I wanna mm -hmm. reveal to you the wonderful gifts that we're gonna have for you. Okay, so I see we have two, four, six names on that wheel. So you now have a one in six chance of winning an exclusive Ashe design poster by our talented graphic designer, Leland Johnson. And you will also win a gift certificate to the amazing Ashe Diaspora Boutique. So, um, Dequisha, hit the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes so visual louisiana i saw that name in the chat and wondered who that was so put your name in the chat and uh your contact information we're going to get that from you and but well, we don't want you to reveal to the world. We're going to figure out a way to get that from you. But you are the proud winner of an Ashe exclusive poster on this 2022 MLK Cesar Chavez Day of Learning and what would have been our luncheon. <laughs> and that gift certificate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mama J. I so appreciate you. You're looking beautiful as always. Look at you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, fam, that's going to do it for our presentation this afternoon. Um, I do, as Asali mentioned, we want to welcome you to join us the rest of this weekend. And next week, we'll be doing some phenomenal activities, starting with tomorrow with our virtual Martin Luther King exhibition opening, uh, which will be housed in the Ashe Powerhouse Theater. We'll be taking a viewing of the, um, the ex exhibition by appointment, of course, um, in, the, in, the, in the times of COVID. But... We will also have a presentation tomorrow evening about 5 p.m. to open the exhibition. Also mention our community health event, which is happening on Monday the 17th, which is Martin Luther King Day. Of course, uh, we will be providing, uh, as Holly mentioned, booster shots, uh, vaccine shots, also doing COVID testing. But also, if we have a blood shortage uh, right now, we'll also be doing a blood drive. So the blood center will be inside the building and doing some um trying to get some blood. I'm, I might give him a little bit of this seven wall soul sauce. You never know, Mama J. You know what I'm saying? Uh, give a little bit of blood and, and help out the nation. Also, on January 18th, the next day, we'll have our National Day of Racial Healing Concert, which will be a collaboration uh, with the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, along with the um, mission of the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, we will be celebrating so many phenomenal, beautiful artists. Please check the website. Please check the, the social media. Uh, we got Soul Galliano, Sonny Patterson will be back, Vicky Yacom, Brother Alfred Banks, 
Um, you know, it's just so many great folks. And of course, we ended the night with Charm Taylor and our dear sister Edith Romero. Also, we'll be dropping off some of her phenomenal words. So join us for that virtual production. And then on Thursday the 19th, we'll come back with the I Am New Orleans conversation, another partnership with the Kellogg Foundation uh, that talks about how to make New Orleans a more child-centered city. And really, uh, it's an intergenerational conversation. We'll have a group of folks with the likes of Yaka Kalamu Yasalam and a bunch of young people uh, from the Be My Collective, from Dancing Grounds, from all over the city. My dear, dear, dear poetess, uh, Akilah Tony will also be on that on that joint. And uh, if you don't know Akilah, you need to know because she's about to take over this thing. Um, so join us all next week. Please check the website, uh, check the social media, check yourselves into um, just some healing and loving on this fine Friday, Friday, as we call it around our shade, because somebody up in here probably has some sort of cocktail at this time that they're sipping on each and every Friday after the pandemic. If you want to come get a cocktail, we are probably already drinking at about 2.30 p.m. at the Ashe Culture. We're getting ready for a happy hour. So join us, man. And uh, we thank y'all so much. Thank you to Carlton. Thank you to Jasmine. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you, Free. Thank you, Mama J. All the folks in the background, Sister Constance, Brother Calvin, my dear, dear love of my life, to me, a kind of booby. And of course, uh, Jess, you know, give it up for Jess and Leland and all the fam uh, here at our Shea Carol, uh, Joanne, Val, Miss Pat, everybody, Jasmine, we, we thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, with that, y'all, I will say, Sarinari, it has been a pleasure and privilege as always. I'm going to go get this cocktail and I'll see y'all next time. Ashe.